Good afternoon, everyone. Did everyone have a good lunch? Everyone get lunch? Brilliant. Cool. Um, applauding the lunch. Let's, let's get that recorded. Um, right, so this afternoon we've got a panel um, session. And um, so, yeah, and it's, it's, around, it's around STEM and education. It's, a, it's definitely a topic that's dear to my heart in that even though I work in a business school and I'm trained as a designer, um, the, when, you get the, when you get the technology part um, front and centre of that, a lot of magic can happen. So um, we, we have that with our students, we, with our hackathons and different areas where we engage with technology. Um, we definitely see a lot more value creation and um, obviously that's the, that's the reason a business school um, I suppose is here, is to, is to understand value and value creation. So uh, I'm going to kick it off um, with introductions. So I'm going to start with Evelyn, please. Um, sorry, yeah, go. <laughs> you just. Um, hello, uh, my name is um, Evelyn and I'm a student at the University of Exeter. Um, I'm taking my MBA here. Um, my background is in graphic design. I started out as a graphic designer um, and then started working in advertising and branding. And here I am. I've been in Exeter for one year. Um, and this is Tamsin. <laughs> oh, here you go. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm um, Tamsin Hodge. I'm a product owner at the UK Hydrographic Office. Thank you very much to those that joined me for track three um, earlier, because uh, that job isn't challenging enough for me. Um, I'm also the UKHO STEM Ambassador Coordinator. Um, we have 26 accredited STEM ambassadors with the STEM Learning Scheme. Um, we do a range of outreach work directly with five to 19 year olds to encourage them into STEM subjects. This is something that's very close to my heart as I haven't had a traditional route into technology. Um, I took a biochemistry degree and then moved into journalism and worked as a journalist for um, nearly 20 years. So was used to agile ways of working before it became agile and then found myself working in a people and technology space. Uh, hi everyone, I'm David Ferguson. I'm head of digital innovation in EDF Energy's R&D team uh, here in the UK. Uh, I'm an environmentalist by background, so I spent 10 years looking at climate change and, and how we need to adopt our strategies as, as organisations and our operations and, and more importantly the culture of our organisations to tackle some of these challenges. Uh, STEM and diversity in the workplace is something that is a, a constant interest and, and challenge for us. I, I work in the technology world where uh, it's an area that's dominated still by men, uh, which leads to, uh, in a, I guess, a, a restricted set of views and opinions and ways of tackling problems. So I think that's something we definitely need to, to be able to solve in the UK. Hi there, I'm Faith Reynolds and I'm not actually a STEM person by background, so I'm actually an arts graduate, German and linguistics, and I went into uh, financial services after university. I then uh, worked in the so voluntary sector, uh, helping people access uh, financial products and services, so working on things like financial capability, how do you understand money, how do you interact with money. and. Um, now I'm working uh, much more closely in regulatory initiatives, so I'm really interested in financial services markets, uh, how do they operate, and, and how do you make the market dynamics work so that consumers get that value that, that they're looking for and that the, the industry works properly, especially in financial services. And um, one of the kind of interesting parts of that is that we base a lot of our UK strategy actually on competition theory. And, uh, and competition theory is, in my opinion, a little bit broken. We haven't quite got it right, uh, so that's perhaps something come back to but but underpinning competition theory is the in, the idea of innovation and technology so I have uh, I work a lot around um, technology initiatives uh, in financial services that are due to deliver consumers better value and I approach these initiatives very much with a strong consumer lens and so um, my colleague here I was talking about being a zero hero earlier. She was talking about zero and how they're going to be using APIs to get bank feeds for uh, payments data, your bank account data get for an SME going straight into the accountancy package. I advise on the design of the APIs. That's what I do. So I'm advising on the plumbing behind the scenes. I'm looking at, so payment initiation was one of those things. So allowing zero to make payments to and from the platform. I'm behind the scenes saying exactly what functionality needs to exist so that the SME that zero serving gets the 
the opportunity to get real value and the market's disrupted. So that's my, my kind of space. And I'm particularly interested in and how do we address some of the challenges around things like consumer engagement, which is underpins kind of markets and competition. Um, how does technology work in that space to Im improve engagement? And, and also, how do we make sure that people don't just engage and get a really good customer experience that works well for the firm, <coughs> but also they get a good outcome? So if you look at Wonga, Wonga's a brilliant experience, payday lender. As a customer interface, worked really well, kind of an East framework, easy, attractive, um, sort of timely, all of that stuff. It worked really well from the consumer point of view, but actually it landed people in debt. And the business model was based on exploitation, which then required regulation. And so the question is, how do you make sure that digital leads to a really good experience, which delivers a really good outcome as well? So that's my kind of background, and that's where I'm interested in how do we get the right education in place to lead to much more holistic thinking about uh, consumers and good outcomes. Oh, got one. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Richard Masters. Uh, I normally uh, get called Dick Masters until somebody uh, Googled Dick Masters on images. <laughs> And uh, I thought, perhaps <laughs> I shouldn't do that, OK? So uh, <laughs> um, I'm the uh, head of uh, university level programs for uh, Exeter College uh, for engineering. 95% uh, of my uh, in intake are uh, higher apprentices or sponsored by industry. And the other 5% are results of my eff efforts to try and open up access to uh, people who would not normally have the opportunity of studying at university level. I'm a huge advocate of student-enhanced uh, learning. Students can enhance their own learning, and during this panel I might tell you how that can be done for free. And um, I'm a big advocate of the latest um, uh, higher apprenticeship programmes. I, I think that's the way ahead for engineering. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Charlotte Holloway. I'm the Labour Party's parliamentary candidate for Plymouth Moorview, uh, which is one of the key seats which will be really close at the next general election. Um, I recognise some faces in this room because before I entered the um, slightly daunting world of politics, uh, I was policy director at Tech UK, which is a national uh, industry body representing about a thousand tech firms. Um, and my background is very much in looking at economic research, looking at the needs of technol um, technology firms, how we get more small and medium sized companies growing, and not just in London and the southeast, how can we do more across the country? And the perennial issue that I always used to speak to firms about is skills, skills, skills education, education, education. That wasn't a deliberate um, education thing there. Um, so um, I think there are um, you know, two great forces that are kind of defining the modern world, defining the 21st century, and they are technology and they are politics and what's happening in our democratic models. And I think it's a really, really interesting and unprecedented time, slightly scary time, but a really interesting time. And what you guys are all doing in this room, what you work on, the companies you work for, the products that you're building, the fact that you build networks and communities together is absolutely amazing. And in a way, I want to be here and learn more from you guys and what matters to you than, than sort of preach about, you know, I'll, I'll probably talk a little bit about Labour, Labour Party policy on national education service and how we prepare young people and people in work for the world of the future. My, um, my own home city, Plymouth, um, you know, I'm deeply concerned about how we give, help people have lifelong skills, that jobs that are in decline, how we help upskill people for the jobs of the future, and also that they're creative roles, high value roles, roles that aren't at risk of automation, but give, give value and purpose as well. So I'll probably talk a bit more about that later, but um, it's just really great to be here. What you guys all do is amazing, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, this is like the issue I think facing society and the economy going forward. Thanks. Thank you very much, panel. Um, we're going to hand over to Chris, who's got a couple of slides to go through quickly to kick us yeah. off. I've got a couple of talking points. Um, hopefully, the slides will work. Here we go. Okay, so it's like a. Oh, there we go. So we're going to do a sort of like a higher or lower sort of um, play your cards right style thing. Um, but for now, I just want you to have a think, what percentage of the UK tech force is BAME, so that's Brit, uh, black, Asian, or minority ethnic background? Um, have a little discussion with your partner, come up with a percentage, and then uh, we'll see what the answer is. 
be interesting to see what the panel say as well. <laughs> okay, right. Okay. So, yeah. Hello. Okay. So, um, if you think it's between zero and ten percent, which is really low, uh, put your hand up. Zero and ten percent. Uh, so this is national. This is not Devon, by the way. Um, <laughs> 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 just put that in there. And between t ten and twenty percent. 20 to 40% and then 40% and higher. Okay, let's see what Tech Nation say. Oh, no, no, ah! <laughs> no, no, there's a video. Oh, I messed it up already. I think it's going to be something that the industry might be a bit embarrassed about, so I'm going to go with A. I think it's A, 15%. Yes! I mean, that's a bad number, but yeah, good points. I didn't expect that thought it was a little higher than that, actually, but... It's actually a bit more than I thought, to be honest with you. Hurrah! Well, not hurrah, boo. That's not good. But hurrah, I got it right. Yes! I'm a minority, so it doesn't seem to be a quite accessible uh, kind of area and uh, sector for people coming from minorities. It's not good, is it? It's, it is, it's embarrassing for us as an industry, and that's fine. Thank you, Tech Nation. Um, so Tech Nation get their stats from uh, meetup groups and community organizations like us, so we feed stats back to Tech Nation, so these are where the figures are coming from. Um, so we saw the answer was 15%, so well done to some of you. Um, next is the percentage of females working in tech, higher or lower? Discuss with your partners. Okay, so can we get a show of hands first for those think that think it is lower than 15%? Oh, interesting. And those that think it's higher, obviously it should be the other proportion. And keep your hand up if you think it's uh, more than double, more than 30%. <laughs> okay, let's see what the answer is. That's it. That's really good. I think it's B, 19%. Diversity is very important, but I'm afraid we won't be that, that good on it, so I reckon it's going to be B. A, 8%. That's it. I'm probably thinking as a developer. It's B, 19%, and it's very disappointing. It's not enough, though, is it? We've got to get out there, you know? We've got to solve this problem. Not surprised. 
disappointed. We need to push for greater diversity for a number of reasons, not least of all is we're creating artificial intelligence and we're embedding it with the same prejudices of, uh, of the same white males, so it's, it's really, really important that, that diversity is encouraged in tech at this point in time. Yeah, hi, I'm all women. <laughs> That's the sound of the day. Okay, so well done, ninety percent. Um, interesting to well, maybe discuss this a bit later. But those who thought that it was lower than fifty percent to find out what industries exactly you work in. Um, so the last question is: uh, What percentage of people? So this is organisations that um, Tech Nation contacted uh, think that talent is their biggest challenge. So was it more than ninety percent of the recipients to their survey, or less? Discuss with your partners. Okay, can we get hands up for those of you who think it's lower, less than 90% think that talent is a problem in their industry, or in the tech industry? And higher than 90%? Uh, well, okay, and those that think it's a lot higher, so more than 40%. Okay, no video for this one, but the number is quite a lot higher, it's 83%. Okay, so we're back to the panel to discuss. Um, who wants to kick us off? Who wants to start? Um, I don't. I think the biggest problem in the whole of education for uh, engineers and technologists is uh, it's all too stovepiped. There's no cross pollination between all the other disciplines, and it goes. I, I would go even further. I don't actually like the STEM initiative. And I, I say that not because I've only got one engineering degree and two Master of Arts degrees, but I believe that the whole point of us being engineers is to deliver the creativity and the, uh, the presentations and the wonderful things that our, our artists, our designers could, can uh, produce and hopefully put on the open market and sell. So I'm not actually in favour of STEM. It focuses too much on individual streams, individual capabilities, and not the breadth of capability, the understanding that you need in the modern world. I think I understand where you're coming from, but the reason we have to focus on STEM right now is because we have an absolutely massive skills gap. And if we don't start addressing it now, our future as a digital nation is in real jeopardy. So we have to take positive action to address the issues now so we can build up capability for the future. We've already started to see some really positive outcome from a focus between um, STEM learning and the WISE campaign to look at filling physics gaps. There's a real drop in um, students taking physics, both female and male, and we've seen really positive results with that in this in our A-level results this year. A similar thing is happening with maths as well. So I think we have to look at where our real pinch points are and focus on those. Eventually, we won't need to be talking about STEM. We won't need a panel to talk about diversity in the workplace because it will just be the way things are. So I think we have to be, we have to realize that we have a problem and we all have a part to play in helping to address it. Okay, so I'm, I kind of agree with both of you. How's that? So I think that there is a need to diversify what we understand as, as STEM and what we understand as the arts. Perhaps we need to kind of think a little bit more creatively. I think primarily to achieve the outcome that you were talking about. So if we think we have a skills gap, that's a skills gap that's trying to deliver on something. And the question is, what is it trying to deliver on? And in my sector, particularly around regulation and interventions and things that actually create the right market dynamics so we have a productive society, that involves more than just um, you know kind of producing some APIs which is 
one of the competition and market authorities' approaches to solving the problem of actually consumers who are paying too much for their overdrafts. So we, we kind of need to close this gap a little bit and think a bit more holistically about actually what is the, the skills gap trying to fill? What's the outcome we're trying to achieve? Then what sort of skills do you need? And actually, I think it's probably much more holistic. And I'm interested in how do we, how do we make sure we get more STEM ambassadors in the arts sector? Because actually, they understand that in order for me to achieve my outcomes in the arts, I need technology. Technology is going to drive this through. Data is going to drive it through. So how do I employ those, those skills um, in my sector? So actually, we're not just seeing it as a silo. We're seeing it as an expansive thing that goes across the sectors. I, I also agree with both of you. Uh, I, I think there is an absolute need to focus on STEM now because we have got that critical uh, shortage of skills. Uh, I much prefer the STEAM, so adding art in there, but really it's not necessarily art, it's more the creativity, so the way that you take those hard technical skills and you leverage them. So, uh, And Lucy's presentation from earlier about data science and, and the skills that she looks for really resonated with me. So you can look at someone's CV and look at their list of programming languages and tell, can, they, can you do the job but do I want you in my team is a completely different thing so have you got the creativity the inquisitiveness have you got all those little interesting side projects that make you stand out so it's that combination of hard technical skills and inquisitiveness and creativity that's important but we do need to have the hard technical skills to, to start with and that is a huge problem in the UK um, so uh, we, we ran a campaign well, we started a campaign a couple of years ago because we've got a massive shortage in, in our sector. Um, and uh, in particular, I think we have 93% of our nuclear engineers are male. Uh, so we're really only uh, appealing to half of the potential workforce. And I was talking to one of my colleagues a few weeks ago, and she said she was the first female nuclear engineer in our business. And she said that when she started, she went to a nuclear power plant and they did not have uh, a women's toilet. You know, just basic things that it just the whole mindset was that women do not work here. So I think there's a whole load of systematic things that we need to change, and it's going to take quite a lot of effort. I mean, skills, access to talent, undoubtedly the top issue facing pretty much every tech firm I've ever spoken to. Maybe Brexit uncertainty is kind of risen quite a bit up the up the risk register, but it's uh, in previous role I had 93% of tech firms of all different sizes said that the lack of access to talent was holding them back. Um, I think it's really critical here we think about the kind of the the pipeline issue we have in our education system in the UK and we can also we could talk separately about access to international talent as well which our tech sector in the UK relies a huge amount on but I'll focus on the domestic side I mean we we talked about about the low number of women in the sector and this this again goes back to our education system most women have made most girls have made decisions about what subjects they want to study by the first couple of years uh, of secondary school and we have to do much, much more to make sure that we aren't locking out half of the potential talent pool much, much earlier on. But there's a broader issue here, I think, about how we think about skills of the workforce. Um, you know, if we think about things like the industrial strategy, how we apply new technologies, big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning to existing industries, so that STEM or STEAM completely agree with that point, that they're applied to, as a, as a nation, our existing industrial strengths. So it's not just about, um, you know, focusing on kind of pure digital. It's how we how sectors overlap, and that's where we get the most fantastic products, the most fantastic innovations. Energy being an example, an example of an industry, and that and many others besides. But if we if we don't have that that skills strategy nationally um, that focuses on those high value digital and helping people in work as well, as well as in the education system, we're really going to fail. We have a government at the moment which is focused on uh, getting three million apprentices, but these are apprenticeships that are the, the way the system structures is low quality, difficult to access, difficult flexibility for employers. So we're, again, we're, we've got a national initiative which is locking out lots of people from those roles of the future so we don't want to set up our young people to then not be prepared for for jobs of the future i could say a whole lot on this and i could say a whole lot on women in tech as well but um you know this is one of the burning issues if our economy is to adapt for the 21st century we have to have our people on board and upskilled to to do it um, I suppose leading, the leading on from that is, is this solution set. What can what can government do? What can industry do? Particularly a big company like EDF, 
what you know you said you've got an initiative but what else what other you know what other tools do we have at our disposal to increase um, this and also to have that I think also to bring that conversation around creativity to bear because that is actually something that's resonated today and it's and it definitely is resonating across business but if you look at the curriculum in in um, in across education that is they're really that's really struggling to come across so what 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 can we do to to improve the improve our odds um, I've uh, introduced a uh uh, a strategy to all of my own students. I encourage them to uh, f create their own LinkedIn site and it's purely for their own uh, uh, personally led uh, enhancement of their learning. In your LinkedIn site you uh, might be able to connect to wonderful people who are willing to act as your mentor or if they're not acting as your mentor then they might know somebody else who acts as a mentor and the lovely thing is that nobody really knows which way their careers uh, are headed um, and if you've got a LinkedIn site you can uh, start branching out to people um, you know uh, can you help me in this I know nothing about this at all can you help me Oh, I can't help you, but I know a man who can, or a woman who can, uh, has got a contact, and they'll they'll help you with that. And um, so I I think it's absolutely vital. We can use modern technology as the answer to your question, Adam. Modern technology, LinkedIn, absolutely free, and students. We should encourage all students to build their LinkedIn site separate from any other. Uh, personal media or anything and the big benefit of it is that uh, since GDPR has come in last year um, uh, you can build your own network and uh, not be in danger of breaking the GDPR rules like promulgation of people's emails personal emails or anything like that it's your own site you are completely in control and if something inappropriate comes into your site delete it I have a question. Um, so, David, you were saying about STEAM and the inclusion of like arts, like being creative and like the humanities aspect of it into STEM. Mm -hmm. um, we're already having um, a problem of like getting um, talents into STEM with the added like requirement for being inquisitive or creative. How would you want assess it? And like, how would you work with like someone like um, Richard or Dick, um, you know, to cultivate um, the students to move into like STEAM and you know be good candidates for jobs of that nature? God, that's a difficult question. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll, I'll try to answer both questions. So I think uh, there's, there's obviously a role for government in this. So our education system is basically not fit for the 21st century. When you look at the way that education works, it's kind of absurd. So I have, I have two kids, they're seven and nine, and we send them off to, to school. Uh, and there's a big wall around the school and there's a gate. So basically school is there to stop kids escaping. And uh, apparently kids spend uh, four minutes per day uh, voicing their opinion in the school. And per week they spend 23 hours in meetings, which is really an absurd way to educate children and expose them to the realities of the world and the, the skills that they need to have in the future. So we fundamentally need to change the education system. We need to change the way that, that STEM is taught, so it's not just pure technical skills, it's the application of those technical skills. Uh, and then as, as employers, we need to change the way that we uh, go about hiring people uh, and uh, the way that we work and some of the uh, HR policies that we have in place. So, you know, it's, it's kind of everything needs to change, unfortunately. Uh, and, and an individual company can change some of that, but certainly not all of it. The, the question about uh, how you integrate uh, art and creativity, I think is, um, I think that's a fundamental part of what STEM skills should be. It's not just can you do the math, can you do the, you know, the technical understanding, it's can you apply it? Uh, and if that's not being taught as, as part of the, the curriculum, then, then something's, something's wrong. But certainly that's, that's what we look for. When we're hiring people, we're very interested in side projects. So it's like, what side projects are you doing? Show me that you're creative. <coughs> I guess just to kind of follow on in terms of answering that question, I think the other thing is that we need to to look at adult education and also at, at kind of decision makers. So, you know, the, the, I work with a range of kind of people who are influencing different ways, and that's, you know, how kind of, you know, technologies 
applied, that it gets its decision makers somewhere else who make the decision about whether that technology is going to be used. And so when I talk about the arts in general, I'm also talking about those places of sort of philosophy and economics and, and effectively arts of persuasion and influence. And at the moment, you know, if, we, if you look at kind of um, boards and the approach to uh, a kind of recruiting non-executive directors or executive directors you know there generally needs to be a level of experience which means that you have an older mm. work for you know an older age for people and i'm working with with people who just you know are not getting to grips with the technology who don't want to dive into some of that detail so they're not they're, they're just a little bit too far away from it and i think actually we have to be really kind of cognizant of, of, of bridging that gap we need to make sure that it's not just that we're in, in bringing the the kind of like the the creative into into stem but we're exporting <laughs> stem into those other areas of, of decision making and philosophy and partly because with the technology comes a heap load of ethical problems and a heap load of kind of moral dilemmas which we aren't actually equipped for because we're not we, you know, we see kind of justice, we see kind of religion, we see kind of moral issues as taboo items that we can't touch. And we need to actually get to grips with that. We need to get real that actually we're going to come up with some really sort of challenging things in future around the ethics of the application of technology. And we're going to need a real diverse workforce to, to make that sense, both with, with age on its side and youth on its side. We need to, but we need to kind of bridge some of those gaps. Um, we're talking about some of the ways to sol solve it. Um, I think an, a, a holistic approach is needed, and I think it's um, needed at several levels. There's um, sort of government levels and policy levels at, at education, then there's at organisational level. What, what can we do as an organisation? Um, and one of the things that we've done, we, we have difficulties recruiting the digital skills we need at, in Taunton, and we're not alone with other organisations across here in the southwest. So you have to be a bit creative, and um, we offer all sorts of things from apprenticeships to trainee programmes, um, undergraduate placement schemes. Um, we do um, buddying systems within work, so we put more experienced people alongside others. The STEM ambassador group um, that I coordinate has become a very strong force. In fact, 70% of our members are women. It's the strongest women's network in the office. It wasn't intended to be that way, but it's been a way of supporting and, and nurturing. Um, I think if businesses can support their local community, that's a really positive thing, thing to do. You know, help the schools, help um, with code clubs, um, allow the, the team to go out there and, and start working alongside young people and be positive role models for them. Um, teachers, particularly today, find it difficult to keep up with what's out there in terms of recruitment and jobs. You know, when they went through teaching college, the, the, the jobs that we have today, you know, data scientists and um, you know, data curators, they just didn't exist. So it's difficult for them to explain what those roles are to a 15-year-old looking to make a life choice about what they should be doing at, at A level. So we can help that we can we can help by when the schools are looking for help um, they'll do that through um, stem learning and they'll ask for volunteers to go in and just spend time with the students and talk about what it is we do and it just makes a bit more sense for them um, again one of the one of the things that we find is that um, students will check out of stem subjects they'll think oh no physics and maths and computing science and that's way too difficult for me and we see an attrition rate as they go through their education. So by the time they come out of school, they've already, um, particularly girls, have discounted STEM subjects as for doing A-levels. And then we see an even bigger attrition drop then they're coming out of A-levels and going into university. So at a very early stage, they're, they're stepping out of giving themselves the opportunity to come into a technical role. So I think there's many, many levels. There we go. We've got the, the, the STEM pipeline there. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so the STEM ambassador role is all about helping through that, but I think there's, there's not one answer to, to all of it. There's a holistic approach that all of us can, can help play a part in. So I'm not a STEM person, <laughs> so I wanted to ask a question, which is, you know, we, we talk a lot about, in, you know, we've heard a lot about data today. Just understanding what is the, what's the kind of understanding of, of of the heads of young people. So why are girls checking out STEM subjects? And I, I'm not quite sure it's because there aren't female toilets. I, I think there's actually something going on in terms of the, the way it resonates. You know, I did languages. I love languages. I really quite like chemistry, but you know, I went for languages. So what, what happened, if, if we got any research or evidence around what resonates and why it's, why, you know, sort of, why girls respond differently? Yeah. Um, 
I was fortunate enough to attend the Women in STEM conference in London earlier in the year where we were looking at a number of um, STEM related issues at national level and the bit that really stuck out for me is what, why is this happening, why are, why are female students checking out and um, research done by uh, the WISE campaign, the Women in Science and Education, uh, Science and Engineering found that in science subjects um, girls are looking for inspiring teachers and if a teacher isn't inspiring, girls check out, boys endure it. Mm. Now, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, so, yeah, they just, if, they, if, they, if they're not inspired, they don't get fired up, they don't think, oh, this is for me, that's it, I'll go and do something else. Um, I want to open it up to the floor. So, um, who's got a question? <laughs> uh, which woman in the room has got a question? <laughs> Hi, yeah, thank you for all your contributions. Um, what about uh, people who have maybe started in the arts and are moving into tech and digital? Um, and what about people maybe in their late 20s who've done that and who are then in f sitting in front of job uh, um, HR pers people who go, so you've got a very diverse background. Can you please explain that? And I said, they're going, well, <laughs> let me start. How can we tackle that? Because yes, I agree, schools, yes, university, yes. But there is a growing number of 20s and 30s who are stuck where they're at because the education system hasn't delivered what it should. So what can we do about those? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think it doesn't just apply to people in their 20s and 30s and doesn't just apply to university educators. Um, the constituency I want to represent, Plymouth Moorview, um, only 16% of people go to university and it's a much older population of jobs which are at high risk of automation. So we really have to be answering these questions about how we help people move into and support them through moving into different types of roles. And I think that's a big question for businesses about how they want to recruit, how they want to work with the education system um, to reach out to people that are looking for their next thing, how they work with um, some of the, you know, whether it's sort of job centre things that are out there and so forth. Labour has a plan, I'm going to do this now, with the national education system, which looks at these issues from cradle to grave. Um, might not have escaped, you know, so I'm getting kicked in from the inside by someone on this chair, so I'm wobbling around. But I'm having a little go, and to the point earlier, A, you know, you already see massively gendered. Um, uh, you know, clothing, baby stuff all the time. But the jobs that exist now, when she's 18 or 16, just, you know, we've got no idea what those are going to look like. So it's, it, these are big, big issues. I think there are things around the computing curriculum in schools um, that I was going to talk a bit about, which, which has failed to get the uptake that we need, which shouldn't just be about people that want to go into computing roles. It should be about people that want to go to any type of role are getting some of these skills. It isn't just about hard coding, but it's about how you do debugging, problem solving, those types of things as well. So these are the big issues, but you know, we need a way of doing lifelong learning that helps anyone get on into those roles of the future. I, I don't have an answer, but I, I think it's absolutely the right, uh, the right question. And um, as you were just saying, this is gonna become more of a problem in the future. So with automation, there are gonna be jobs that will disappear or elements of jobs that will disappear. And many of us will probably be working in completely different areas in 20, 30 years time. Combined with the fact that it's likely we'll be living for much longer and we can't work for uh, 30, 40 years and then be retired for 50, 60 years, we're much likely to have very long careers. So it's probable that we will have multiple careers. So being able to continually learn and retrain is going to be a, a, a crucial thing for us all to be able to do. And, and I think that needs to be embedded at quite an early stage as well. So that continual learning is, is, is crucial. I actually do have a strategy which I've applied for the last six years. Um, I, I, uh, every year I have about a dozen people, perhaps they're 34, fitting into your category. Perhaps um, all of industrial experience, life experiences, believe that they haven't got the, uh, the, they're not on the right path, they want to move into a more technical area. Uh, but they don't have the two uh, A levels or equivalent to study at a university level uh, uh, learning. And so what I do now is I've uh, created a pre-HNC um, level, which is first year degree study um, syllabus course on um, Khan Academy. 
and I send them this whole load of links and it links to lessons on the Khan Academy, which is completely free. And if they uh, uh, register with the Khan Academy, register me as their mentor, I can see their performance on the lessons on the Khan Academy in mathematics. And uh, it's about 90 hours work for the average person without an A-level to complete. But actually, I'm not really interested in whether they actually complete all of the lessons. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> I'm not interested. I'm interested in their motivation and whether they can actually sit at home and study four or five hours, uh, you know, perhaps the whole of a Sunday uh, to do enough work to be able to be successful with university level learning. And I've had about 16 people come through purely on the Khan Academy and uh, two of those were students of the year. Uh, so that, uh, and if anybody wants that opportunity, come and see me and I'll put you on the Khan Academy. <laughs> I think there's um, also something about the way in which recruitment happens in firms. And actually that's a real challenge because it can be a very opaque process. And although you know, there's, we've made stride as a country to try and make, open up recruitment and make it transparent and give people equal opportunities, there is a, a question about actually how we see technology applied. So aware of a, a company that's sort of, you know, when, it, when it's vetting, when it's going, it gets a CV, it's also gathering vast amounts of data from different different sites like Facebook, et cetera, and saying, okay, well, they've used profane language on Facebook, that's, that, that sends a signal to us, which means this. So there is a whole kind of, uh, there's a whole kind of question around profiling, positioning, uh, sort of personal profiling and how we display ourselves outwards, uh, which is kind of well known, but also then how is that interpreted and used and how transparent is that so that the, the, the end user, kind of the person who's being recruited recruited or always rejected understands what was it in my online profile that I can't see that you decided against me for so and that's a sort of another space where you kind of say well, what's what's happening in the backgrounds how do we make that process more transparent and also how do we um, how do we correct things and and so that our data is clean and neat and tidy and comes across as, as best as possible another question from the floor please so, um, there's been a lot of talk about the education system feels to me like we might get more value from detoxifying, from the virus, honestly, from detoxifying existing workplaces. I know there are high dropout rates for women and not only gender people in those environments. And I've witnessed over a sort of 20, 25 to 30 year career in those environments, you know, quite a lot of casual kind of everyday sexism. I've witnessed a lot of situations where women come in and they do marketing work or they do the admin roles and even if they get to develop but they're doing front end stuff rather than kind of core uh, like middleware or anything like that it feels like solving that problem might generate better role models might generate more opportunities within firms for women to progress and that might then lead to more pull of those people through the, through the education system so yeah, I think um, I think the the culture in a workplace is really um, important. It's all very well promoting yourself as a, um, a diverse employer, and then you get there and you find you're the only woman or the only Asian person there, and you've got no support network. You know that can be um, very difficult. Um, I think coming back to the holistic approach, I think yes, there is um, things that can be done to deal with. Um, uh, issues in the culture of a, a workplace, so whether it's hierarchical, um, you know, women seen as being the um, person that just does the admin rather than actually that can play a, a technical role. So that, that comes down to education, that comes down to having male advocates actually, ma male and female advocates at the senior, the senior board level. Um, and uh, you know, providing opportunities for women and minorities to shine, creating the space where they can show um, that um, they're able to do perhaps a more advanced role and challenging some of those um, behaviours. I don't have the answer to it because every organisation is, is different, but I think it's a, you've made a good point. There has to be some way that structurally you can fix that because there's a lot of attention going on in the education and <laughs> I mean, it's it's a question that resonates with me 
personally, when I when I was a teenager, I was doing physics and maths, went and did some work experience down at down the dockyard in Plymouth, and. Uh, just completely different environment from what I was expecting. I was like, no, I'm not doing engineering. I'm going to go down a different path. Um, you know, so completely understand what it's like to be a young person walk inside of, into an environment and just go, this isn't full of people like me. Um, and then to sort of work in the tech industry a few years later and find that, you know, a decade more later, that's still the case for a lot of young people is is... Um, you know, really alarming. I think there are a number of things we can do. We could look at the number of women on boards, uh, which has been a big theme recently. We can look at, and it's not it's not just about women in tech, but that is obviously a big issue. And you know, being now being a politician, you know, the the stats aren't much better for women in politics either. Um, so that there are big big issues. You have to look at ourselves. You know, there are there are you know there can be things that some firms look at. Um, there are some examples of firms who will ensure that all their shortlists have to include X, X percentage of women. The, you know, that is a controversial thing. But if firms aren't changing and they're not adapting, then it's something, you know, sometimes you need a, a hard measure that, that creates the change that's that's needed. Um, there are initiatives that can happen to support mentoring, training. You know, I've, I know people in roles that have had specific training to help them get on and accelerate and build, whether it's building confidence, building skill sets, you know, those are things that can happen. And that can be for lots of different um, diverse groups, not just for women as well. Um, you know, is there something we can look at? You know, you're, you're, you're from companies, many of you will be from companies in this room. You know, what would incentivize your firm to look more at these kind of issues? You know, I'm, I'm as much open to hearing suggestions that I can feed back in. Um, but it is an issue, and it is an issue that needs to be addressed because, you know, back to the earlier point that was, that was made in the video, we are creating these technologies that are fundamentally reshaping in the world, and if they're not being created in 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 you know sort of our image, which sounds a bit bonkers, but you know if, if they're not if they're not indicative, if these these products and services that people are using day in day out don't reflect those that they're serving, then that that's a big big issue. Well, it's just occurred to me that um, one of the recent initiatives we've taken in the technology centre is that every project we compare against the uh, United Nations Sustainability Development Goals and we look to embed those in absolutely everything we do now. Uh, every output, every project uh, deliverable, uh, we uh, uh, assess it against the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, which includes uh, inclusion, uh, diversity and all that sort of thing and I think if we embedded that in just the general engineer uh, delivery of engineering whatever type of engineering in, in well in the world that's the ultimate aim then I think we would see an improvement in these sort of issues that you're talking about <coughs> David, you've got the mic. Have you got uh, well, I, I, you don't have to. No, no, I was just kind of reflecting on some of the things. So, I, I mean, I don't work in HR, but as, a, as an employee and a, a hiring manager in our company, there's a few things that I've seen that have been quite effective. Uh, one of those is adjusting um, some of the, the frameworks for, for, for working, so flexible working, kind of changed hours, so things that work more uh, for, for women. And, and the second is the creation of a bunch of uh, networks. So you're talking about kind of having a bit of a support network. And we've, we've had uh, women's network, BAME network, carers network, um, fathers network, uh, cancer sufferers network. And we found those to be really, really effective, actually, because, you know, we're quite dispersed workforce, but having that kind of network of people who are in similar situations and having aspiring speakers come in is really good. Brilliant, thank you. And another question? And I did it. All right, so, so I'm going to stay on the issue here. So let me tell you, I'm, I'm a newly appointed professor of data science and network science here at the University of Exeter, and I'm also the head of the department of computer science. So I think our efforts, including what we do, is try to actually include women, um, ends up not being so effective because if you look at that pipeline, we are trying to deal with the issue once it's unsolved, right? So my question is actually more to Charles, right? Because I just moved from the US, and, uh, and I see the same issue today. I don't see anybody talking about first stage education, right? Elementary school. Even if we look at the pipeline, I think it's a little misleading, because at that point, those girls, many of them, are already convinced by someone, by one of the uh, doing this, that they are not really supposed to go into STEM. Right? So and this is
is why perhaps they get lower GSC, um, a level scores, the GCSE scores. So what is actually being done, at least in this country, since I just moved, I just moved here a month ago, mm -hmm. uh, to actually try to tackle the problem at early stages for elementary schools? Yeah, it's it's the question. I think we need to be tackling, you know, not just from a sort of uh, moral imperative is the right thing to do to have a diverse workforce, but it's it's the economic imperative as well for the country that we need to be getting all the all the talent that we can in. And you're right, you know, a form of selection bias in that pipeline, I'm sure, is there very very early on. Um, and you know, you'll know that the U.S. has been rife with stories of terrible culture within particularly some of the big uh, US uh, tech firms. And, you know, we hear some stories, m maybe not as uh, on the front pages, but, you know, some stories of firms here in the UK along those lines as well. And that, that has to change. And we need laws and regulations where, where women are actively discriminated against or don't get option um, action, uh, don't get uh, access to those kind of opportunities. We have to do stuff. But um, you're right needs to start earlier on. I think there's a big question, uh, you know, I would put this back to sort of teaching. We have schools across this country which have had their, their budgets cut in real terms since in the last eight years. Um, teachers that are not getting pay rises uh, in real terms uh, since 2010. Um, so when you look at, you know, whilst things like Khan Academy are great, at this the sort of age that we're talking where interventions need to happen, where people get infused and passionate about, about interests and hobbies, no Nothing replaces the love of a good teacher in a classroom. We have more classrooms than ever with over 30 students in. Our teachers are struggling, let alone to have the luck, you know, if you have a school which has a code club, that is great. But, you know, um, the uh, bottom two quartiles of uh, uh, income children from low income families in the southwest for example none of them will go to an outstanding school so there are real systemic issues here which you know perhaps won't surprise you given I'm a Labour Party politician are about funding are about giving teachers the resources they need are about freeing teachers up to teach so that they can um, you know spend that time with students, with pupils, building that passion early. Now, I would love to see that passion be about STEM, about computing, about about creativity, about questioning the world, about being curious, about why why does Google work like this, or why does X work like Y? Um, those are the kind of things we really need to be thinking about. You know, I really do think we need a massive, massive step change in education. Just, um, I think the other thing about primary school education, except for, you know, and I'd be interested, this is a um, this is a speculation on my part, and other educationalists might be much more aware of the stats, but um, there's a real gender diversity problem in primary school, as far as I can tell. All the teachers are female. They're all female. You know, it's a great place, if you're a woman, to go and have a job is in teaching. It's, a, it's an avenue, probably because if you want to have a baby, you can, and if you want to have the school holidays off, you can. So there's some stuff around that job being particularly attractive for women, but also, in some senses, a little bit unattractive for men. I don't know why, I suppose, because we have a media undercurrent that men aren't quite trustworthy with children. So we have got some, we've got some cultural problems here as well. So we need much more diversity in the workforce at a school level, at primary school level. You know, we need to see more men in there, but we also need to sort of see that, that kind of mixture of different sort of talents and, and interests coming through. But, you know, if we're saying that women are under-engaged in, in those, those areas, and then we are seeing them mostly in schools, mostly doing all of that science learning, actually are children coming out of primary school much better at the kind of like, the sort of writing a story and doing their spag, because actually that's much more akin to what that teacher's gone into that classroom with than actually that teacher having gone in with a science or technology background. So there's some issues around diversity in the workforce there too. Time is catching up with us, guys, so unfortunately I haven't got more time for questions, but I'd like to thank the panel um, for, their, for their answers today. I'm going to ask them just to sum up maybe a minute or two each. Um, and just um, you know, give the, give us some last thoughts to take away. I am um, I'm sitting here reflecting that you know this is a really these are really complex challenges, and they seem to um, sort of I suppose they're cross cutting. Uh, but I suppose each each one of us has a has a role to play, and if we're aware of these issues, then maybe we can we can do something about it. Um, Tams, if we want to start with you, just about um, your last thoughts, please. Yeah, I'm just um, picking on what you were saying. We've we've talked about holistic approach and. Um, I'm just wondering if um, there's a, a couple of things for us to, to take away. Um, as far as um, 
job descriptions, I think. Um, if you're looking at a job description in a technical role, whether you're applying for a job or um, looking for a friend, um, have a look at it. And if you think you want to apply, go for it. Don't be put off. Um, from an HR perspective, um, it's been proven that actually writing job descriptions in a more um, open and inclusive way, you'll get a much um, higher rate of applicants as well. Um, if it says you're looking for five years of experience, um, a man will apply if he's only got about a year. A woman will think she needs to have seven. So there's got to be a balance in between some, somewhere. Um, and there are opportunities out there if you do have a diverse background, um, you know, wear it with pride. Don't be, don't be um, afraid to say, you know, I did an arts degree or I've done science and now I'm doing something else. That's a rich bit of life experience and there are opportunities out there. So you can bring that to life in a job application. You can go on a returnship programme. We're just piloting one at the moment for people that may have had a career break just to see if that provides an opportunity. So, yeah. Um, just go for it, I'd say. A uh, slight tangent, but um, I, I'm particularly interested in artificial intelligence. And uh, what we're seeing is that uh, this technology is opening up enormous number of, of possibilities, but also posing deep ethical, philosophical questions. Uh, I kind of think that we're entering the golden age of philosophy because all of those big philosophical questions that we ask ourselves hypothetically in interesting pub conversations, we're actually going to have to answer. So what is the answer? Should I drive into those children who are crossing the road or crash my car and kill the, kill the passenger? We have to know the answer to that now. And having that answer hard-coded by a 20-something white computer science geek in Silicon Valley is, is not OK. So, <laughs> so we need a very diverse uh, workforce who can tackle some of these, these questions in a very diverse and representative way. I think I'd just echo that. I think we need to look at the society that we want to create and the one that we want to live in and actually be a little bit more clear about what the problem is that we're trying to solve so that we know how to get the right solutions and who's going to help us with that. And whether that's a diverse workforce that's all generalists or whether that's a specific workforce made up of technical specialists, we're going to need a mixture of things. So I think we need to really focus on what it is we're trying to solve. <laughs> I think uh, my concept of developing your own uh, enhancement of learning for you personally as you progress through your careers, find those people, those wonderful people out there, and there's many, many of them who would be more than happy to mentor you in anything you want. Anything you want to do, there will be somebody out there who will help you and uh, develop your uh, network. Yeah, it's been a great panel. Um, thank you so much for, for having me along. I think a lot of these questions are about the structure of our economy and our politics as much as they are about technological developments. And in my mind, as somebody who spent a bit of time working in the tech sector and is now being a politician, I see that we cannot treat them in isolation and we can't expect our politics to politicians to know nothing about technology, whether you're talking about encryption or um, AI or whatever it is you hear politicians trying to talk about completely failing. And similarly, I want more and more of our tech communities, and I say this to the guys in Digital Planet, to, to really start coming up with ideas and thinking of solutions. You guys in this room and what you do, you create amazing solutions, ideas, products, you know, your networks, your sharing of ideas, they create they create solutions to the things you're doing day in, day out. We need that kind of thinking in policy making. We need that kind of thinking in how we solve these challenges around the education system and learning. So I think we need to bring our politicians and our policymakers and our technologists closer together um, in how we solve some of these big, big issues. But, um, you know, because, you know, these things can't happen uh, in separation. Also, you know, my final note is, you know, the Tories have made massive cuts to education. The industrial strategy doesn't work for the kind of technology and all of that sort of thing. But i um, happy to talk more about that afterwards. But, uh, you know, get involved. It, don't, let, don't let this stuff just happen to you and your companies and the projects that you're working on. Get involved, have a say and come up with solutions because that's how we create a better world. Cheers. Join me in thanking our panel. Thank you very much.